Okay, good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, this evening, we have a few housekeeping uh, and introductory slides to go through before we get into our panel discussion. Uh, so we will go through these um, just to make sure everybody is set up and uh, ready to go and able to enjoy our event to the best of everyone's abilities. So for accessibility information, uh, we do have closed captioning available. During the webinar, we have Trish from National Captioning Canada, who's with us this evening. Uh, to enable the transcription, if you don't see it already, uh, the directions are below. In the Zoom bar at the bottom on the far right, it should say live transcript with a little box that has CC in it. If you click on there, and you click show subtitle, then that should pop the transcription up on your screen. And the transcription is in English. We also have uh, two interpreters with us this evening who will be doing interpretation in ASL and they will be visible on screen throughout the presentation. Okay. The webinar is being recorded as well, sorry, uh, and it will be available um, on the CBRC website at the end uh, later on once we get through everything. Thank you, Paige, and thank you everyone for joining us. I'm going to offer a land acknowledgement. The members of Pivot Nova Scotia would like to acknowledge that many of us live, learn, work, and play in Mi'kma'ki, the traditional and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Prior to European contact and colonization, traditional Mi'kmaq territory covered all of what we now call Nova Scotia, PEI, and parts of New Brunswick, Newfoundland, the Gaspé region, and May. <coughs> this territory is covered under the Treaties of Peace and Friendship, which the Mi'kmaq, Maliseet, and Passamaquoddy people sign, first signed with the British Crown in 1726. The treaties did not deal with the surrender of lands and resources, but in fact recognized Mi'kmaq and Maliseet title and established the rules for what was going to be an ongoing relationship between nations. The effects of colonization persist to this day, and as settlers on this land, we aim to amplify and learn from the lived experiences of the Mi'kmaq peoples and uplift their resilience. In our work of systems change within healthcare, it's important to recognize the value of traditional and cultural practices in medicine and mental health, particularly <coughs> for Indigenous to us LGBTQIS folk, IA plus folks. And uh, we encourage you in the chat to um, say your name, your pronouns, and your territory. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome tonight. Um, I'd like to go over some community guidelines for this evening, just to ensure that everyone feels safe and comfortable and respected in this learning space. Um, so the first one, uh, keep conversations focused on the topics that we are discussing. Two, respect pronouns. Uh, this means not assuming the pronouns of someone based on their presentation and or appearance and using the pronouns that they inform you to use. We also invite you to put your own pronouns next to your name on Zoom. Uh, if you don't use pronouns, you can just put your name or you can put no pronouns in brackets. Uh, if you do not understand pronouns or you have more questions about pronouns, we would refer you to mypronouns.org for more information. And three, we will delete and address comments that are anti-Black, anti-Indigenous, racist, transphobic, biphobic, homophobic, all the phobics, ableist or discriminatory. That's not welcome here at all and won't be tolerated. Um, and regarding asking questions to the speakers, please don't ask them personal questions that fall outside of the topic that we have come here to discuss. And a little bit more of the guidelines. These are referring to the chat function and the Q&A function. Um, we welcome an active chat during this event. However, we ask that everyone adheres to these following guidelines. The first one, please do not ask other participants for personal information, stories, or experiences. You are welcome to share your own experiences, but please be mindful that we do not have any debriefing support for this evening. 
Um, two, respect that attendees come from many backgrounds, bringing with them various methods of communication, uh, education, experience, and cultural understandings. We're all here to learn and engage in discussion. So please be respectful of where folks are coming from with these topics tonight. And three, um, alert a moderator, RT, who goes by she, they pronouns. If you feel that someone is engaging in the chat in a way that is harmful, disrespectful, or does not adhere to the guidelines that we have set out. Okay, so we have a few uh, kind of key terms that we discussed kind of at length in our pivot meetings and while we were putting together uh, this event. And these are working definitions um, of some of, of the terms. We wanted to define kind of the context in which we were discussing some of these things. So I'm just going to read through what's on the slide. So we're talking about needs-based care spaces. And for us, that is a broad concept that relates to any space, either in community or by a professional where a person seeks care for their physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual well-being. Hello, there we go. Healthcare is another broad concept, which is similar to how we were defining needs-based care spaces. Um, it does include Western perspectives in uh, medicine and well mental wellness, but it is not limited to Western perspectives. Uh, our acronym 2SLGBTQIA+, 2S is for two-spirit, L, lesbian, G, gay, B, bisexual, T, trans, Q, queer, and also questioning, I, intersex, A, asexual, and plus, the many other and ever-evolving identities within this community. Uh, 2S, or two-spirit, is an identity term that's used by some Indigenous people. Um, we're placing it at the front of the acronym as a decolonizing practice. The queer rights movement has been whitewashed to erase significant contributions by black, brown, and indigenous queer, trans, and two-spirit people. And it's important to center their contributions and learn the true history of the movement uh, for us to move forward and build a more inclusive and just future. We're also talking a lot about community connections. So if we define this as the coming together of groups of people with shared interests or needs in the capacity to support and hold space for each other. Groups can consist of a small number of people from a small geographical area or can extend to the wider global population. Connections can be in person, virtual or online, depending on accessibility and what feels most appropriate to the group. Cisgender or cis being a term for people whose gender identity aligns with their assigned sex at birth. Transgender is an umbrella term or, or sorry, transgender or trans is an umbrella term for people whose gender identity and expression uh, does not match their assigned sex, either some or all of the time. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Kirk. I use he, him, his pronouns. I am the regional manager for the Community-Based Research Center for Atlantic Canada, uh, the organization that sponsored all this. So I thought I'd tell you a little bit about CBRC and a little bit of the background about Pivot. So bear with me because I lost my notes for a second. So what is the CBRC? Well, we promote the health of diverse uh, people of diverse sexualities and genders through research and intervention development. When we were founded in 1999, it was by and for cis gay men. Our founders were tired of be, uh, research being done on them or to them instead of with them, by them, or for them. We've expanded beyond that to better represent the broader 2SLGBTQIA plus community. We still have some projects specific to queer men, such as our semi-annual Sex Now survey. And a lot of our funding has focused on the prevention of HIV 
and sexually transmitted and bloodborne infections, this has shaped a lot of our work. I am pleased to say though that we're expanding beyond that, of course. Our four pillars are community-led research, knowledge exchange, network building, and leadership development. That last point includes programs such as Totally Outright, which is focused on health promotion skills, investigators, which is focused on queer health research, and, and uh, Do You Mind, which is focused on mental health. We continue to be a community-led and community-focused organization. We are, fun fact, a uh, registered non-profitable charitable organization about some giant uh, corporate monolith. Uh, our main office, however, is in Vancouver, British Columbia, which is where we were founded. And we have satellite offices in Edmonton, Toronto, and here in Tobacco, Halifax. We don't do this work alone. You never can. CBRC couldn't succeed without the support community members and partner organizations offer. So let me tell you a little bit about Pivot. Uh, Pivot originated from our recognition that true change needs to be upstream, that we need to look at the systemic roots of health inequities uh, for 2SLGBTQIA plus people. The program is divided into two parts, as you can see in the slide, curriculum and then intervention development and delivery. We want to give participants a common language and grounding in health inequities and an understand, <coughs> sorry, and, and an understanding of systemic ch challenges. Then we give them some tools and resources to develop and design their own intervention to address the, one of the challenges that they have identified. So that's how we all came to be here tonight. Uh, social connection is a key theme for all our leadership programming, and that's been challenged during the pandemic. But uh, based on my limited interaction with our participants, I feel confident that we've made some success there. Ultimately, Pivot wants to focus on the strengths of our community to enhance our existing knowledge and skills so that our participants can become the leaders in uh, improving inclusive and culturally competent care. Pivot shifts the focus uh, to changing the systems. While individual action is good, we know that the greatest changes can come when we change the systems in which we live, work, and play. I'm so excited to be here tonight for this event uh, with some amazing presenters. I know several of them. Uh, on behalf of CBRC, thanks to our Pivot participants, our facilitator, Stella Seth, our panelists and moderators, and of course, to all of you who are attending this evening, uh, please check us out online at cbrc.net and please make sure to complete the evaluation survey we'll be providing at the end. Uh, that's it for me. I don't know who's going next. Okay, um, thanks for that, Kirk. Um, just making sure I'm not muted. All right. Um, so, Throughout Pivot, we've had multiple guest speakers. We went over core modules and had conversations about 2S LGBTQIA plus experiences uh, within healthcare. And we learned and discussed that many barriers that our community faces within the healthcare system. And we wanted to name a few that are relevant to the goal of this event. Um, but before I get into it, I just wanted to put a quick disclaimer that is, this isn't meant to be discouraging because um, it's important to acknowledge these barriers and challenges beforehand so that we can appreciate the progress that we've made so far and look into how and in what ways we can continue to make progress. So um, to us LGBTQIA plus folks, especially those who are targeted for marginalization based off of multiple identities, um, already face many barriers when it comes to accessing healthcare. Um, but those who live rurally face added challenges when it comes to proximity to resources, including higher cost of travel to access services, lack of nearby professionals trained in providing gender affirming care, fear of confidentiality breaches within small communities, services that may only be accessible periodically, added challenges when attempting to discreetly access health care while living in an unsupportive household, COVID road stops for those traveling to procedures and appointments, and that's more relevant to during lockdowns when you have to provide proof of why you're going between different zones, um, and not enough and underfunded community resources offering support to folks navigating rural healthcare. Our goals for this event, we have some just broad goals and things that we're hoping to achieve through our discussion this evening. We wanna create more spaces and resources 
for community building. So that's our community connections for 2SLGBTQIA plus folks, especially for those who are living rurally. We want to have a discussion around community building, discussion around navigating healthcare, both as individuals and also as communities, how to support one another in navigating healthcare. Uh, for healthcare workers looking to better understand the barriers that 2SLGBTQIA plus folks face and for them to engage in these discussions. Uh, for those folks who are not deeply involved with activism to understand how they can engage with this work uh, with the time, the energy, whatever their capacity is that they're able to offer. Providing folks with tools and some inspiration for systems change. There's a lot of positives in this as well. It's not all um, negative or, or heavy all the time. Uh, and there's a chance to learn for all of us to learn from our panelists who have put a lot of time, a lot of energy, and they have a lot of skills uh, in community building or talking about healthcare access in different, in different ways for 2SLGBTQIA plus folks. asking questions during the event. We encourage you to submit your questions for our speakers using the Zoom Q&A function. Questions submitted in the chat might be missed. And without further ado, we are so excited to welcome our moderator, Leanne Khoury, and our speakers, Caitlin Cullen and Lee Hyde. Um, so Seth, if you could, stop sharing your screen and then we'll let the speakers and moderator be featured. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you for this introduction, Stella. Um, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Leanne Hori. I am um, a Palestinian, Canadian, Jordanian, uh, what have you. Uh, person living in Djibouti since 2002. I've moved here from Amman, Jordan in, for university and I just really liked it here and I wanted to set roots um, and stay and like create a, uh, like figure myself out um, away from home. Uh, I'm very excited uh, for our panelists who are joining us. I know one of them and I would, I'm would. i excited to get to know the second person. Um, so I'm going to ask um, Caitlin to tell, tell us more about themselves and the organizations that they, uh, and communities that they belong to and then we'll move on to uh, uh, Lee. Absolutely. Uh, hello everyone. My name is uh, Caitlin Cullen. I go by she, they pronouns. Um, I'm also in Kabuktuk and uh, I'm a Métis uh, first year slash third year psychology student through the Bachelor of Arts program at Dalhousie. Uh, I'm studying psychology with a minor in Indigenous Studies. Um, I transferred from St. of X last year, I believe. Um, and yeah, I'm a cycling instructor. Uh, I lead uh, two queer slash trans slash quest questioning friendly youth groups in Pictou County, Nova Scotia called Rainbow Recreation and Youth Pictou County. Um, I'm the social media manager for Dal Out, which is the 2S LGBTQIA plus society on Dalhousie campus. Um, and what else do I do? <laughs> I work for Dow Student Life um, as a social media manager also. Um, and I have two jobs at the Dalhousie Indigenous Center. So full plate, um, And uh, but I love doing it. I Everything I do is to give opportunity to those in need. And I would love to be an example to those who need, uh, to, uh, to see opportunities so they can dream of what they deserve, which is only as only the best in my eyes. I love that. How about you, Lee? Oh, Kaylin, I knew you did some of those things. That was, that's a lot of things, good for you. <laughs> um, 
I met Caitlin quite a while ago now before um, they were doing lots of these things. So it's really cool to, to hear about all that. Um, so I'm Lee Hyde. Uh, my pronouns are they, them. Um, my, my primary role these days is I'm provincial coordinator for Sexual Health Nova Scotia, which is a provincial nonprofit that um, kind of encompasses a network of sexual health centers across the province. Um, there are six centers in our network. Of course, there are some other organizations that do sexual health services who are wonderful friends and partners of ours as well. Um, and I, I previously, up until last year, uh, was also South Shore Program Coordinator for the Youth Project. And though I don't technically work for them, uh, I adore them all so much and am still very connected um, to their work and very connected to all of the young people uh, that I met while doing programming here for the last, I think it was almost six years I was doing um, programming here through that. Previous to that, other lots of youth work um, lots of stuff around to us, LGBTQ, um, IA plus organizing and um, community groups here on the South Shore. Um, I am on the South Shore. I don't know if I said that I'm on the South Shore of Mi'kma'ki. Uh, I'm from here. I'm, I am from, from as much as you can be from, I suppose, when you're uh, settler ancestry. I'm from <laughs> Mahone Bay uh, and I have moved around a bunch and I'm now living just outside Bridgewater and um, rural Nova Scotia is certainly where my heart is. So I just continue to live and work and, and play here. Um, I think those are the roles that are most relevant to this. I um, certainly have a lot of my own personal experiences around being a rural queer trans person and accessing healthcare. So I'm sure I'll get into some of those pieces tonight too. Thanks everybody. That's wonderful. Um, so we're going to just keep this casual. We're just going to like have a, like a friendly little chatty chat uh, with one another. Uh, so like no stress uh, about anything. Uh, we've all seen the questions. So um, so I am just a little city boy living here. Came from a city town in Jordan. So I don't have a lot of connections with like rural, uh, living rurally, um, apart from like staying in the tent in Cape Breton a couple of nights uh, last summer or the summer before. Um, so I want to know what your connections to advocacy in rural healthcare is and um, what prompted you to like start all these uh, advocacy work that you have done here. And it's popcorn style so whoever is drawn to speak. I mean, what prompt, ugh, I guess, you know, it, it's, yeah, it's commonly said, I guess our own experiences sometimes lead us into the, the work that we do or the advocacy that we're passionate about. So certainly, you know, growing up in a rural community, um, you know, and uh, in sedate myself, you know, in the like late nineties, early two thousands, um, you know, trying to sort of figure out who you are and access appropriate healthcare as you're coming out and all of those things and um, cycling through identities, terms for identities, and then trying to find, you know, appropriate healthcare and services and community connections is a challenge. And um, I didn't find a whole lot of that. Um, and when I moved back here and started working for the youth project uh, in this area, I think connecting to young people, you know, over the last eight years or so that I've been back on the South Shore and realizing that a lot of their experiences were the same as mine were so many years ago um, was disheartening. Uh, of course, there's differences too. Lots of things I could speak to. I mean, virtual connection is a huge difference between their lives and, and mine when I was their age. But I think, um, yeah, just realizing that so much sort of hadn't changed, sadly, um, was a big motivating factor for me to continue to to get involved in things. Um, and then I think, you know, I, I gave lots of thought to sort of the social parts of healthcare um, in different areas of the work that I've done. And then working with Sexual Health Nova Scotia is really when I started to kind of get deep into kind of medical healthcare and these pieces that I wasn't as familiar with um, from the structural side, right? I just experienced it on like the, the user side. Um, and so now it's kind of a big, it's become a really big passion of mine over the last couple of years to kind of advocate for 
bigger changes to, to structures and systems around healthcare in Nova Scotia, um, which I think are like, we've, we've got a long way to go. Uh, so there's a lot of work to do. I guess that's my bottom line. Uh, yeah, I'll leave it there. Let Caitlin jump in. For sure, absolutely. Uh, I was just gonna build off of what you said. I find um, I, in 2020, I had a, a big long manic episode. And like, I, like what you said before, Lee, um, you, you spoke about um, like self-advocacy almost and like, um, like find like you, the path you go on is um, led by your past experiences. So in my experience with that, um, I found myself uh, self-advocating a lot and uh, finding self-education and uh, I found a lot of people learn how to do these things and manage uh, their mental health and their physical health um, on their own. And if clinical services are not available in rural areas, it immediately becomes disappointing uh, when they don't tell you. Like health, when healthcare providers who haven't lived it uh, don't tell you things that you want to hear, I guess. So like, yeah, I would find, I believe that like self-education and self-advocacy really translates into what I do in the future, like, and what I've done in my, with my future, which is, um, yeah, I, I hear a lot of stories about in rural uh, areas, um, how hard it is to go to school and, uh, face challenges, like when I was uh, conjuring up uh, ideas for this uh, panel, I've, a lot of youth reached out to me and were like, shared their, were gracious enough to share their, and brave enough to share their stories with me. And uh, yeah, it's, we've got, definitely got a long way to go. Absolutely. Yeah. And like, uh, from like a person of color perspective as well, like we still have so much work to do. Um, like the system is like riddled with like anti-black racism, anti-indigenous racism, um, all the homophobias and biphobias and all that garbage um, is still living and like breathing well in, in the healthcare system. And um, I remember like that one time I was, um, having, I, I was having a mental breakdown and I called, I don't know what number I called. And they basically told me like, my problems weren't as important as other people's problems and I should get over it. So I was like, mm, you know what? I'm gonna find a way to dismantle this mental health system uh, because this is fucked. And yeah, here I am working in mental health and addictions, um, trying to work one, like this, like making people change their minds about different things and like trying to, work from an anti-oppressive and anti-racist lens is, is challenging, especially when I'm one of three people in my health department field who are who is a person of color. Uh, like provincially, everyone else out of 25 is white. <laughs> and so that's fun. Um, so yeah, no, I like I I relate to all of what we're all of you are saying, like how things happen to us and that propel, propels us to move. Uh, to create the change that we want to see because we're just tired of just living through that back backlash um, and like just tired of people telling us no so like I'm so happy and so proud of both of you uh, for creating the changes that we want to see in 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 this province um, so like let me know like, tell me why is advocacy important in addressing the challenges that the two us LGBTQ communities that you work with face Um, I can say that um, I think advocacy is important um, because it's so ingrained and assumed so often that um, heterosexual slash like cisgender like roles of patients are like so in, like I don't know what it is but the word is but like it's so assumed and like they will treat you like your labels and I wish there was like 
a peer support system in place within like the ment mental and physical health sphere because like like I have I've had for you to reach out to me and be like I wish there was like a you or um there's someone in my uh who also runs Rainbow Rack named Joy Polly that they're like I wish we had one of you or a Joy Polly in the school system to help help us help us navigate everything and stand up for each stand up for others when they don't have necessarily the strength at the moment too so yeah I think that's why advocacy is so important. Yeah, I, I really agree. I mean, I think, and you made a good point when you were speaking before, Caitlin, about self-advocacy, which often people don't even realize they're doing, I think. Uh, a lot of the kids I talk to who talk about sort of educating their family doctors, you know, about hormone therapy and things like that, um, they're doing self-advocacy without even realizing it. And they're, they're teaching healthcare professionals about the lived experiences, you know, of 2S, uh, 2SL. <laughs> even even we stumble can I say queer and trans is that good enough for now okay good thank you um it's been a long long week and it's only <laughs> Wednesday um yeah I mean I think our lived experiences if if we're not seeing it reflected in those who are working in the in the healthcare field and it's really important what you said Leanne too like if if you know our healthcare providers our mental health care providers don't reflect the diversity of the people that they're seeing well then they're not going to recognize what the lived experiences are like you know if if a healthcare provider has no experience and no awareness around sort of the stressor of facing racism day in and day out they're not going to have any capacity um to you know provide appropriate health care if it's if it's never even occurred to them <laughs> um which would be i that would be shocking in this point in time, but then again, you never know. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I think advocacy in terms of, you know, just speaking about our lived realities is, is advocacy, just standing up and saying who we are, just, you know, continuing to out ourselves in health healthcare settings um, as much as it's not fun at all, um, you know, I think is yeah, is, is advocacy, you know, just, just sort of not backing down. Um, and I think also, you know, when I think about advocacy, another thing I think about is kind of using your voice in specific places, right? So, you know, I have the privilege of hearing from a lot of different people, a lot of different kinds of people about their experiences with healthcare, whether they're, you know, queer, trans, or other kind of identities that might be marginalized by the system. And then if I'm in settings, in my in my role, if I'm in settings where I have a voice, I need to bring those messages out and those stories out, um, rather than just sort of speaking to the status quo of, of, you know, what politicians or healthcare, you know, higher ups are used to hearing. It's taking those opportunities to speak those stories um, and not yeah, not backing down from the opportunities to do that, um, even though it can be a challenge sometimes, and not being afraid that we will lose some of the privileges we have. Um, it's more important to speak about what's really happening around us. Um, you know, it's, it's sometimes a balance, but I think at the end of the day, to me, um, making sure that people's voices are heard, the most marginalized people's voices are heard, um, is, is just really essential. So I'm going to take the opportunities I can when, you know, in this role to do that, I think. I love that so much. Um, can you um, speak to the importance of community connections in finding resources, sharing knowledge, and developing skills in navigating healthcare? Because I feel like that's super important in, I, I from, listening to other folks who live rurally, that's very important. Uh, when you live rurally is like to connect with other queer queer folks, queer and trans folks in the area, like, and they have like all the knowledge of like, oh, I've been through this, like, let me pass that on. Um, so can, can we talk more about like the knowledge sharing um, specifically in rural areas? Um, I know in communities of color uh, here, they, they also do that. So happy, uh, want to hear more about what happens in rural areas. Yeah, I mean, as you could expect, it can be really challenging in rural areas um, just to just to get people across big geographical spans to come together to talk and even to find who your people are. Um, 
it's it's so complicated to unravel what being out means in a rural community um and even to like narrow it down to like a rural Nova Scotian community you know there's so many different ones and what it looks like being out in one you know versus another and and the other factors of who you are affect that right and um I struggle with it all the time, even in the role I'm in, you know, in healthcare settings, uh, I'm often, I don't really refer to this as dead named, um, because my legal name I, still gets used a fair amount, and I'm okay with it in some settings, so it's not, I don't, it's, for me, it's not a dead name, but for lots of people, for sure, that's how they see it, but, you know, I just have to navigate some of that. I go to the same pharmacy to pick up my medications that I've been going to since I was born and the pharmacist is like the same person and they comment on my hair color and call me by my other name and uh, it's, it's it's weird and I don't say you know to every person I meet that I'm that I'm queer that I'm trans and so because we have to navigate that then it makes it harder to find your people hmm. but there have been some really cool efforts and I think the pandemic you know it's made it harder but in another way it's made people embrace you know technology as a means to connection which of course is all kinds of pitfalls of but it is beautiful to see you know people coming together across spaces um through through using you know technology and I think I, I've enjoyed seeing how much that's happened in my community or the communities I'm part of across the age span as well has been really nice to see. There's some really um, like consistently meeting well connected groups of older queer folks here in the South Shore um, that I've been kind of like a little bit tuned into since I was younger. Uh, one of my best friends who is a trans guy like infiltrated the I think they called themselves like elder lesbos or something at the time like so yeah older lesbian folks uh they had a, a group a social group i i think they still sort of do but yeah my my trans male friend uh infiltrated the group which was amazing and and then brought me along for the ride so i've kind of you know gotten into that space a little bit and then to see them embrace some of the um youth social connections that were happening we've been able to bridge some of that we've gotten people online that haven't been online before um and it's really cool to see that happening so i'm i'm glad to see that it's also you know it's a really big challenge to bring people together when they live in rural communities there's just it just is <laughs> yeah i think it's that's great like the all the across ages because i feel like there's so much knowledge to share within different age groups from people who have already lived it in a way that's not um always has to be so um so daunting and scary um i think that the importance of like sharing uh community connections and resources is very essential to navigating healthcare because um we are we are what we can see is what my friend Sally O'Neill says. Um, so that means what we can be is what we can see represented. So I feel like representation is really important within every sphere. And like you said before, Lee, it's very hard to find your people in these days, but um, yeah. Um, just being able, my dad always says, um, make the most of every opportunity. And that's what I live by and is to go out and make the make the most of what you can and whatever you can manage that day, not pushing yourself or um, knowing you're listening to your body and knowing your limits, but um, really, putting yourself out there and uh finding those resources resources can be really difficult like when i moved to picto county in grade 12 um i didn't even know a lot of these resources existed even it, like i was living in calgary before and to learn that they had even more resources that i could have accessed in my times of need was really um a, a big shock to me. So um, in the age of technology, it's much easier to find those resources. But I think to someone 
looking back in my shoes would have benefited from more accessible um like a list of resources and like what to do and such because the internet wasn't that well known like we had like flip phones and stuff like when i was a teenager and stuff so um i mean i guess we had computers but like it, it was hard to see your your parents would see your search history and such if you didn't know how to navigate it but um yeah i think that's why it's so important because uh it really develops those life skills to be able to do that and i think it's up to us as healthcare providers or community members or people working in nonprofits or just any anyone is to uh, really set forth those uh, uh, resources as much as we can and promote it um, because there's someone out there who will definitely need those uh, resources. Yeah, that's uh, those are super important and I like not to also date myself, but when I moved here in 2002, I didn't even have the language to describe who I'm attracted to or what I'm feeling. And even like back then, like sure, like having more, like there was starting to be more LGBTQ representation on TV, but like people were still using, oh, that's so gay as like a slur. So it's just like a very confusing, the 2000s, early 2000s are a very confusing time for a lot of us. Um, so I, like, I wish there were a lot of resources and I wish there was representation for us to see. Uh, I'm low-key jealous of all the, the youth now because they have all the cool representation. I'm like, oh, I wish I had that. Now I'm just gonna have to watch all the teen shows that have like queer Arabs on there. And I'm like, oh my God, this was me um, kind of situation. But no, I, I like resources are super important, but uh, also, both of you have shown like that you have so much resiliency, um, and I would love to talk more on that topic and like uh, like the reason. Can you tell me more about the, the resiliency, the knowledge, and the skills that have that already exist? Because like you wouldn't be you if there wasn't already the uh, the resiliency and the knowledge and the skills that have existed in your in the queer community rurally that maybe you have not tapped into, but maybe you have or you watched from a distance. Um, and like, how can we tap more into it now uh, in this day and age compared to like when you were younger? Um, and what can we do with that? Um, yeah, I can jump in on that. I think um, first thing I thought of when thinking about sort of the resiliency that exists around me that like maybe I've been able to tap into um, is a friend of mine who should probably be speaking on this panel because she's amazing and she uh, has been around doing the work for a long, long time. But her name's Diane, a queer friend of mine who lives here is from Yarmouth originally, um, an older person. Hopefully she's okay with me saying older. Um, but something I really loved, we used to work together at Second Story Women's Center in Lunenburg and something I really loved so much, um, and I've had this experience with other folks as well, um, was just like hearing the stories of what it was like growing up queer in Yarmouth in, I don't want to date her, but you know, before my time. Um, and, you know, I think some, I don't know if it was her specifically or some of her friends were able to speak with um, Rebecca Rose when she was writing before the parade um, and talked about, you know, waiting months and traveling all the way from Yarmouth to Halifax, you know, to go to like sort of like one, you know, queer night at a bar that happened like driving all the way back at two in the morning you know because they couldn't afford to stay overnight in Halifax driving all the way back to Yarmouth and going like slipping in and out of the life that they were you know living day to day in Yarmouth it was like and I remember Diane saying something like you kind of crossed over like once you got to around like Tantal and all of a sudden like this other thing came out of you that you knew you were going to allow allowed to be for the night and then as you went back you know, you kind of push it back down, which is so funny because I can really, even now relate to that. There's a feeling when I drive in and out of Halifax um, and it feels like 
you know, or, or I leave a specific, not even just the city versus the rural, but I leave a specific queer space and I go back into kind of regular life um, here. And it feels, there's just like a putting on a layer, taking off a layer or something like that. Um, it's a really, yeah, it's a feeling I'm really used to now. And it, it was interesting to hear that, that that was true for for older folks here who, you know, grew up queer in, in a different time. And I think, you know, I've had kids who would say that when I was running the, the youth group here, that they would say, this is the one space, you know, two times a month I get to come here. This is the one space where I get to um, be called by my name, my pronouns, <laughs> you know, be honored for who I am. People aren't making assumptions about me. Um, it's just like, and it always felt like I knew exactly what they meant, even though when I was their age, you know, there wasn't a group like that. I certainly didn't have the language that I had now. I don't think I heard the term trans until I was in my 20s, at least. Um, but but there was still I could knew exactly the feeling they were talking about of like being seen, essentially. And it's, you know, resilience is a, is a beautiful thing. I, I see it in, you know, my friend Diane and the older folks I know here. I do see it in myself. I see it in the younger kids I work with. Um, certainly some of whom face like a lot bigger barriers even than I do. Um, but it's also, it, it does feel like a bit of a light, like it's a big coat. <laughs> Let me put my coat of resilience on again so I can face, you know, face going back into a community that assumes I'm something other than I am. I mean, I've, I think adjusted my appearance to like a level of <laughs> queer visibility so that at least I don't get like, you know, I don't get straight washed too much, um, but I certainly still get, you know, I still get misgendered and all of those things. And so really it's because I have this kind of big coat on to protect me from those things every day that I'm able to deal with that. And, you know, I'm, I'm speaking to very personal experience, but I, I see it immediately in other rural queer folks here that I meet, you know, I meet a new queer trans person. We have a my office is inside the South Shore Sexual Health Center, and there's a, a transformation closet here, which is a gender affirming uh, gear and products project so that people can access free gender affirming gear um, as needed, which is, I mean, I can't even imagine if that had existed when I was young, but anyway, people come in all the time, you know, I'm in my office, I just like kind of listen, people coming in and saying like, I mean, I can't believe this is here, you know, just to be able to even see a binder or a packer or a gaff like in front of their eyes. Um, and I can hear and feel like them dropping their coat of resilience as they come in the door, like, and they see in front of them, you know, we have like a little mannequin right in the main space that has like a harness on and a packer and stuff. So you can't escape it as soon as you walk in, you know what you're getting into, but like you can literally feel people drop that um and it's beautiful and sad and difficult and all of that in one so that was a long rant i'll stop talking for a second okay um yeah i've for resiliency like knowledge and like skills that already like exist in rural communities i think acknowledging them that the programs that are already there and the great work has done in the past is a really good important first step to recognize um and like in picto county like there's been so much work done and like since i moved there but there's still so much work that needs to be done like i think like holistic help and like to tap into that and build upon it i think would be like I mentioned before, like help from the inside and like having not just uh, guidance counselors that help you with your courses, um, also help you talk about really challenging things you may face at home or within the classroom or within the hallways or anywhere. Um, and yeah, I think to ta like to build upon it, there needs to there needs to be so much work done oh my gosh like it's like from when I was in high school to like now it's just it sounds like it's deteriorating so much in rural communities it's very 
disheartening, but um, I also think like the silent expectation that like mental health and like disabilities like that are, are static and like the process of healing is like linear is like a really toxic narrative. So like, I think, yeah, it's just big to unpack. And uh, I think, uh, yeah, a lot of the work needs to be done. I hear you on that. I feel like sometimes like you need to take a step back, even though like things are destroyed, being destroyed around you and you're like, okay, what needs to be done? I think sometimes it's like an okay thing. And like, I 100% I agree with you, like recovery and like mental health is not a linear thing. Everything is like uh, all over the place. Um, so like, I feel like as organizers, like we definitely need to have others that we can support, like who can support us in order to support others. And I think that's very important. And I hope, you know, you're both finding ways to like care for the, care for yourselves in that way. Um, so you both are like into activism as am I, um, but like what are the tips um, that you can share with folks who are interested in creating something or creating a community um, or doing like something, some sort of engagement um, in their own rural communities or even like communities of color around, like, because those are also small um, that you can give um, for them. Yeah, um, I would recommend to definitely look what interests you first and then see what places you can start like by volunteering if you'd like like anytime that you're ready um and in the mental health space to do that um but yeah um always i i, I realized very quickly um in my first two years of university that i cannot help others till i learned how to help myself um and like for those wanting to um engage in your community, I would suggest to never assume that you're an expert on anything, especially like on other people's experiences. So like, I'm still learning every day. I still um, learn new terms. I learn new uh, things that are happening that I thought like were doing okay. I still um, am I'm learning a lot and yeah so my recommendation is to see where you can manage your time and uh, manage your energy into and um, protect your energy is what I would recommend first like most most importantly um, yeah yeah I definitely I second everything you said there and I think um, you know uh, honoring what you what who you are I mean there's like sort of a uh idea out there that like if you're interested in something you go on the internet and type it in, <laughs> you're gonna find other people who are interested in that thing right like Pokemon Go I don't understand but like it came and then everybody found each other literally and like we're running around together doing you know this thing so I only know this because of some little kids in my life, but there's lots of adults playing it too. Um, but I think if you're, you know, for example, a non-binary queer person, you know, in a rural area who wants to talk about like how hard it is to access, you know, healthcare services that are relevant for you where people don't misgender you or assume the, you know, nature of your relationships, there will be other people who are having those same experiences. And it, if you can find the kind of courage and bravery to put it out there, that that's that's who you are, and that's what that that's where you're looking to connect, um, you know, you you'll be able to find those people. And some of that, I think, is through connecting with organizations that are doing work around those things, and that maybe don't have the capacity to start sort of social connection or or advocacy activism types type projects or campaigns because. 
that I'm seeing this a lot and I see it in our own organization, of course, all of our sexual health centers, other than Halifax Sexual Health Center have one staff member. So, you know, they're, they're doing so much work. They sometimes have, you know, ideas about things they want to start in terms of social groups or in terms of like, you know, an awareness campaign. Um, but they just like don't have the, the capacity, the funding, the staff power to do it. And sometimes, you know, if you can reach out to an organization that maybe seems to share kind of your, your values or your interests and say, I had this idea, is this something that, you know, would align with your organization? Can I do that? You know, can I team up with you? And then they can help you, you know, without too much effort on their part, get the word out. And then you find those other people. Um, and it benefits, it benefits them, it benefits you, it benefits the community. So I think that's a really good way of doing it. You know, there are struggling nonprofits all over this province. And, you know, I work for one and also am someone who can't afford to donate to anything, but I occasionally have, you know, time and, and energy and passion on something. And so if, if that's your situation, then, you know, reach out and, and make those connections that way. And then I think also what you said, Caitlin, about like, you know, you got to take care of yourself first. It's interesting that sometimes through your you're taking care of yourself, whatever that looks like, your self-care, you also connect with other people. And sometimes, you know, advocacy or whatever grows out of that, um, just connecting with other people around, you know, trying to take care of yourself and how hard that can be, right? I have a friend who we just go on walks and talk about how hard things are sometimes. And, you know, out of that, we've kind of started to plant some seeds and grow some ideas about some things we might, we might want to do in the community. Um, and so it's really just come from us kind of being like, oh my God, I need to go for a walk and talk to another person who's like not in my family or like related to me. And, you know, then you kind of find your common stuff that you're struggling with. Um, so yeah, those, those are, I guess, my, my tips and, and to use technology to your advantage, even though it's a challenge sometimes, um, it's just sometimes when you're isolated, when you live early, when there's a pandemic, it might be the only way to connect to other people. Um, but there's lots of ways to do it. You know, it's amazing how Facebook got us challenges, but I will say Instagram connections to other people has been really fulfilling for me over the last little bit, finding people that way. Um, and kind of teaming up on ideas or just on like struggles that we're having. So, yeah. Yeah, those are super relevant. And like, um, can you imagine like doing a pandemic without social media? I feel like I would be so sad and uh, living in a cave somewhere because um, that would be back in the 1800s. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I agree with both of your, what you're saying. I remember when I started um, queer Arabs or when I was thinking about starting queer Arabs I didn't even know how to start I remember googling be like how do I start a social group what do I do and none of that was helpful um, I had to go to um, South House um, the Gender and Sexuality Center at Dell I was like hey I'm interested in starting this how do I start one like literally one of the coordinators there, Jude Ashburn, like we just sat down with me and we went through step by step what we're looking for. Um, and then I remember having to come out to a friend from back home, uh, mostly because I wanted to create a poster in Arabic and like wanted it to be like comprehensive, like using non-gay slurs on it and like, you know, just make it more comprehensible. And like that person was so cool. And they're like, yeah, I have a lot of gay friends. Like, it's amazing. Like, you know, let's let's create this poster for you. And I remember walking down with uh, one person down the street and I like hanging up posters and I immediately got a response from someone because they saw something in Arabic. And they're like, wait, I am queer too. And this is for me. And they're like, hey, can I join? And I was like, it's perfect. And that's how queer have started. So it's like creating these connections uh, is so amazing. And I love seeing people uh, be like resilient in their own way um, and like create their own different kind of acti activism through the group. And it's just so, so cool. And like the only way to do it is to support and like support their dreams. And I think that's, that's so great. Um, so like I have a final questions for everyone who's listening. Um, what are your calls to action for next steps in healthcare advocacy? I know we have some, we have three question and answers, but how do we uh, 
create next steps for this. I know Lee has a lot to say about that, and but I'm also curious about Caitlin. <laughs> Um, okay, I can jump in before. Uh, uh, yeah, um, so I think like one of the first like things to remember, like for healthcare advocacy, like advocacy is to remember that like advocacy is not simply just tolerance, like nobody needs to be like just tolerated, like, like from a lived experience, like perspective, like, I keep going back to like, um, like bringing people together in like a really empowering way. Um, and like within the system, there needs to be uh, help. Um, it's like a way for queer people to, and the queer slash trans slash questioning people to get like talking, get us listening. Um, these communities have like real stories and real lived experiences that like all fight against like the conservative like narratives that like exist so much in our society and like it's it would it may not seem like a big deal to use someone's pronouns but it's all those microaggressions and lead to major aggressions i don't think that's the right word but oh well um uh and um it takes takes a lot to change people's minds about gender and uh, sometimes chosen family or yeah chosen family and if we're lucky enough blood related family can be like like all we need is that like one person and that could be a peer that could be a friend that could be a family member but just to have that one person could be the difference between life and disliving and I believe like success is fluent um, and can change every day, like on any given day, but like advocating for queer slash trans slash questioning youth um, as a leader for future generations like means everything to me. And um, yeah, it's really important to, uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I have so many thoughts and I'm trying to think about which are the like most relevant to state, I guess. The first one I'll say is that like, you know, the healthcare that, I mean, any healthcare that queer and trans people need is primary healthcare. Mm -hmm. It's primary healthcare. Uh, it, it is essential healthcare, um, sexual healthcare gender affirming healthcare, reproductive healthcare is essential primary healthcare. Um, it seems to have been forgotten a little bit in this province and I will not stop, I will not get off my soapbox. Um, it honestly seems to have been forgotten that, you know, a pap test, primary healthcare. Uh, prescribing hormones, pretty routine primary healthcare. Uh, physicians do it all day long. They may not always do it for trans people, but they do it all day long and they can do it for trans people really, really easily. <laughs> um, the training for things like that is free. It's easy. Um, you know, we just, we've turned sexual health services, which often when we use that term, I mean, there's all kinds of sexual health services, right? So if you're getting an STI test as like a cis straight person, because I hear those exist. If you're getting a test, you're getting a sexual health service. But um, when we use the term sexual health services, we're also often referring to like specifically services for queer and trans folks. It's somehow like those lines got a little bit blurred, but those services, you know, are not specialized boutique services. That's what, how we've, um, that's the box we've put them in in this province. Doctors get paid less at Halifax Sexual Health Center to do services that they would get paid the same amount to do in family practice, such as a pap test. That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> these are these are like primary healthcare. Okay, so you've heard me on that one. So one call to action is to continue to state, you know, if you're lucky enough to have a doctor or if you're in any settings where you have any kind of say in terms of healthcare, you know, continue to say that these services, you know, services for queer and trans folks, um, including, you know, gender affirming services of all kinds, 
Those are should be, you know, standard primary health care services that people can access when and where they need them, not at their own expense, not traveling, you know, hundreds of kilometers to access. That's not right. Um, we just have kind of accepted that this is where we're at in this province is like a healthcare crisis is normal. It's not normal. <laughs> it's not acceptable. Um, and so my second thought was going to be, you know, we need to hold our government accountable, governments accountable globally as well, um, because, you know, we're, we are, we make up the people, the population, um, even though, you know, we have a lot of differences between us, um, governments should be responsive to us. And so it is in th terms of things like a healthcare crisis, which relates so strongly to like affordable housing and like living wage and all of those things they are tied together. Right. And it, you know, we have to keep talking about these things. We have to keep saying we are living in unacceptable conditions in some parts of this province. There are people that don't have like, you know, access to clean water. There are people, yeah, it's just people who have to drive hours to an emergency room to get, I don't know, like a regular STI test. Like, what are we doing? So I guess just continue to talk about this stuff, continue to hold government elected officials, you know, accountable. Um, and then I guess, yeah, my, my last sort of call to action was going to be, um, you know, to, to, to take care of each other, right? So when all, when all those other things fail, when all systems fail, um, and governments stop listening and all these things we, you know, we all experience, um, and there's a pandemic and people like just pretend it's not happening. Um, we, we have to take care of each other. And I think queer and trans people, you know, and not, not always and not in all situations, but have gotten used to, you know, that's part of resiliency, have gotten used to taking care of each other. Um, and I think that's a, that's a strength, you know, and I think it's true for other groups and other, you know, communities that are tightly together um, is they, you know, at, at the best of times and the worst of times take care of each other. So we have to keep doing that, you know, um, and protecting each other the best that we can and honoring each other for, for who we are. You know, I'm so proud to have parents in their seventies who try their darndest to um, call me by the right name and pronouns every day. And, you know, at the same time, a, it said in my bio five month, but seven month old uh, nibbling as of two days ago, he's seven months old, um, who's growing up in a world where, you know, he's getting to learn from his parents and his family that he gets to be like whatever he wants and wh whoever he is is awesome. Um, so I feel like there is some hope um, just like taking care of each other. Yeah. That's so cool. I have one more call to action um, from everyone. Um, this is like near and dear to my heart, um, but um, Pride Health uh, is our only um, access to LGBTQ healthcare in NSHA. And currently it is at 0.8 fulfillment. So like somebody who, so Gary Dart, who works there, um, works four days a week and just by themselves and they only cater to central zone which is just Halifax area and um, they have a lot of work to do um, and they don't have the support they're not paid very well and I feel like creating an LGBTQ specific department would be so fucking cool uh, and yeah. I, th I think we need to and like nobody's listening nobody's listening we've been talking about creating like you know just at least giving Gary full time position is give a... Gary full time hours. <laughs> Damn it! <laughs> I'm so tired. I just want to go yell at people, and I have. I've yelled at my bosses or somebody else's boss. I don't care. What are they going to do? Fire me? I'm brown. Uh, <laughs> they can't. It's racist. Um, so yeah. Uh, so if you have a chance, talk to your MLAs. Talk to your uh, people in healthcare and advocate for better access for pride healthcare. And yeah, <laughs> there you go, Dylan. Thank you. Yeah, Dylan. <laughs> yeah, I, I super second that. And it, it, it should be a whole team. Um, yeah. And, and Gary does so much advocacy to try to improve things and not much has changed in the four years that I've been with Sexual Health Nova Scotia in terms of of Pride Health's work and, and the other organizations doing similar stuff um, in the community rather than um, inside NSH. But like, yeah, just, yeah, agree yeah. with that. 
So thanks. Um, we have a couple of questions um, in, oh, we have four questions. That's exciting. All right, I'm gonna start with the first one um, from Colin. It says, I'm curious if there are any panelists that are working in a research focused capacity that could speak to the work that is being done to work on a systems level to improve 2S LGBTQ access to rural healthcare in Nova Scotia. I'd love to learn about some essential strategies that have been helpful in Nova Scotia that could help partners across Canada to mobilize change. That's a great question. I feel like Gary would be able to answer this question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you know, we, we try to tie, Sexual Health Nova Scotia tries to tie ourselves to folks doing research um, because we don't super have the capacity to do it ourselves. Um, and our only staff member, that would be me, is not like great at research. Um, but uh, I guess there, so a couple of things. So there have been a couple of research projects to try to gather more information about what queer and trans uh, folks face in rural communities in terms of healthcare. So that's sort of a starting point, right? To try to understand what the realities are. I can tell you what the realities are, but we need, you know, research that we can, you know, written out that we can hold up to the government. So there have been some, you know, there has been a bit of work on that. Um, and Shins has a project right now around um, rural understandings, not just rural, but there is a focus on rural understandings of HIV prevention. Um, that's with our lovely partners, CBRC and the AIDS Coalition, um, to try to find out what folks kind of understand about HIV prevention in rural communities. And that will help us then, you know, go to the next step of, so how, it, what are the gaps and how can we provide that information in, in rural communities and, and other communities? Um, so I think, yeah, I, I, I do think research is super important to this. I don't think there's been like nearly enough. Um, and, and I don't know if I have like specific strategies I can point to, except that unfortunately we, you do kind of sometimes need to do, you know, that kind of strict research to be able to then hold it up to government and ask for what you already know is needed. <laughs> you didn't really need to do the research, but you did to prove your point. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I don't, um, unfortunately, I'm, I'm with any groups that um, do research about that topic. Yeah, I feel like in health promotion, there is some stuff coming up, um, but I feel like we're so late in the game when it comes to like rural healthcare. It's like usually folks are like, oh, we're just gonna be so cool and like study just urban stuff where it's like, but there are gays living in, like there's queers living in like, rural areas. Like, let's look at their like, community so I think it's we're just starting to start like to talk about it I remember I think one of my co-workers is very interested in like uh, rebuilding queer um queer spaces in like Digby area so that's been super fascinating to hear stuff from him uh, especially when it's like involves like uh puppy play so I was like oh that's cool super cool like tell me more about puppy play <laughs> I love this um so yeah uh there hopefully there's more coming out but it's pretty pretty sparse I would say um when it comes to um research um another question from Kyle um who, who says um, I really love the comment about pharmacist. Uh, one concept we are not te yet teaching within the program is how to navigate therapeutic relationships when somebody is slash has transitioned. I feel like this is very relevant to rural practice when patients are usually well known. Um, any advice on how we can integrate these skills within our curriculum? Um. Okay, so I don't know if this is going to answer the question, um, but what jumps to mind for me is that, um, so I used to teach groups for kids who were like nine to 12. And something that we were talking about was, uh, we would do community standards, right, at the beginning of the group, like, what do we want the you know, nature of the group to be like, what are your thoughts? Like, what would make you feel safe in this group? And something that they said every single time was, um, no judging, right? <laughs> we are not going to judge each other in this group. And I'd be like, great, that's awesome. So does it just happen? Like we say no judging, we write it on this giant whiteboard and then that's it. <laughs> There's no more judging. And they're like, no. And what I kind of 
would say or get them to understand was that usually judgments happen because we've made an assumption in our head and then we've said the assumption out loud in some way before we've processed that it is an assumption that we've made and not like an actual thing that we know. So often when I'm talking about gender identity, I start with like not um, speaking out the assumptions that you've made in your head um, and realizing that they're assumptions before they come out of your mouth. And I think sometimes people think that they're exempt from that when they know someone. <laughs> Like, but I know this person, right? And a pharmacist in a rural community like mine, um, I won't name my pharmacist, and they're great. Like, it's not, this is not a slight, but like, they are seeing me come in and being like, oh, I know this person, you know, and they, and they like, just without even thinking, they go right into like, um, you know, saying the name that they know for me, saying she pronouns, right? And so I guess the advice, you know, in the curriculum would be, you know, like to it sounds simple but like to tune into and work on that like filter where you stop yourself when someone comes you know in front of you and you go okay let me just pretend I don't know anything about this person and and then from that place you know I may have the name in front of me I can say you know uh I've got the name on the prescription is this is that correct you know, rather than just assuming it's correct, I can use they pronouns for everybody that comes in. I can ask them, you know, is that uh, what pronouns would you like me to use? You know, but like just stopping before you sort of go right to like, you know, the she, her that you think, you know, either based on the fact that you've met this person before or based on their physical appearance, which we do constantly day in and day out. And it's retraining your brain to not go right to that. So I know it sounds simple, but it is a practice, right? People think that, um, you know, once you learn this, that it'll just happen naturally and it doesn't, you, you have to practice it. Um, so I guess, you know, some way that, that education for, you know, folks working in that way would be able to kind of practice that. And people hate role play. I don't know why, but my first degree is in theater. So what do I know? Um, people really hate role playing, but it helps to practice. So make all pharmacy students role play is what I'm saying. Done. I totally agree with what everything you said. Um, I would just add on, um, like what I said before, is to like take every opportunity, like there's so many opportunities to learn about these things and to encourage your like your colleagues to learn about it. So yeah, I would just suggest to take every opportunity you can to learn about 2SLGBTQ plus uh, issues and how to um, how to be a, a good ally. Yeah, and um, also not necessarily a 2SLGBTQ uh, thing, but the Bloom program trains, uh, uh, like it's a community, trains community pharmacists to like improve mental health for folks with addiction. Um, and like, it's like kind of one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I can put the link in here, um, connect with uh, Laura Miller. Um, she teaches at uh, Dell sometimes. Um, and she's pretty great. She's my desk mate uh, whenever I used to go to the office and she's really loud and great. So uh, yeah, chat with Laura. I think Laura would be able to help a lot as well when that comes, uh, when in that subject too, like she's super cool. Um, Colin has another question. Are there any community initiatives happening in Nova Scotia that are pressuring the provincial government to address the gaps like policy changes, funding shifts in rural uh, to us LGBTQIA plus services. Um, apart from Lisa LaChance, I think, um, who just actually submitted a bill. So I would love to hear more um, from folks. Yeah, well, Kirk, um like jumped <laughs> the, the queue or whatever and put the, what I was going to say in the chat. Um, so yes, there is a um, policy that's been developed by a group of like amazing student volunteers uh, who just sort of, well, they're trans. So they have obviously impetus to do so, but they took it upon themselves to develop a new policy on um, gender affirming 
care. Um, so I think Kirk put the the link there to their website. It's like they're they're honestly they've done such amazing work. It's it actually blows my mind the amount of work that they've done um, while not being paid to do it. Somebody should definitely pay them. While we're getting Gary full time hours, we need to also pay these people mm -hmm. for the labor they just did that should have been the government doing it. Um, and now the government better pay attention because all they need to do is take that policy and just pass it along because it is awesome. Um, so yeah, that's a, that's a really good example. And that's such a good example of community advocacy too, um, that they just, they just did that. But also we can't expect trans people to do that kind of labor because it's a lot, but it's amazing. It's just shocking that, you know, our trans MLA is doing the work too. So it's like, uh, is it shocking? Is it not? Right. Just like, just like the anti-racism bill that they just, uh, you know, passed, I guess, or a motion to pass. It's like, of course, for all four of our African Nova Scotian uh, leaders or were on the committee. And it's like, am I shocked? It should have been done a long time ago. Right. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, last question from Colin. Um, how can other leaders in the 2SLGBTQIA plus in other provinces support you in the work that you are doing? I keep hearing a lot about lack of support or capacity to create change, et cetera. How can other leaders across Canada help? I think one of the first steps is creating more like permanent solutions rather than um, non really like temporary solutions like um, like like there's so I, I, I keep looking like there's so many like grants out there and like so many um, very specific like they have very specific criteria and like they do not pay wages and it's mostly run by volunteers. So like, I think creating like a permanent solution, like rather than relying mostly on volunteers would be a great step um, and paying attention to what already exists um, and building upon that and putting their efforts into that and um, expanding would be a very good first step. Yeah, for sure. I have I have kind of two thoughts in the moment occurring to me. So one is that, um, you know, sometimes it can be hard to advocate for another province because uh, all of provinces struggle in similar ways around this topic, I think. But um, for example, so in the last federal budget, there was a promise of, you know, a few million dollars to support sexual and reproductive uh, health services and um, none of that funding made its way to Atlanta, Canada. So, you know, it would be nice. <laughs> like, sure, we also are happy that people in other provinces got money to do things. I work with some great organizations in other parts of the country, um, but it would be really nice sometimes, you know, if other provinces would, um, you know, kind of at least just, you know, just just make the stand and say, hey, you know, we're connected to this organization in Nova Scotia. Um, and we heard that whatever, whatever. Um, you know, I, I'm sure everybody's heard us say that we get forgotten about in Atlanta, Canada. I won't bother to say it again, but it's, it's true. And all you have to look at this is this example about the federal budget to see that it's true. Um, so that's one thought, but my other thought was going to be, I think connecting to organizations that do similar work, um, has been really, really awesome for me. So sexual health Nova Scotia is a, uh, affiliate of action Canada it's a federal organization, around um, sexual health and rights. And because we're an affiliate, there have been, at times when people have the time, um, there's been like affiliate calls where they bring together, so like Saskatoon Sexual Health and Planned Parenthood Ottawa and us and whoever has time to join the call. And we talk about, you know, our work and the similarities, you know, are astounding. Like the challenges we're facing are so similar. Um, and we share success stories that, you know, other people can like build on um, what Planned Parenthood Newfoundland has done with their 2S LGBTQIA warm line is the most inspiring thing I've ever heard about. Um, you can probably read about it on their social media if you don't know what I'm talking about. But hearing those stories like to inspire us in our work and then to like commiserate on the challenges and kind of come together in that way has been really, really helpful for, for us. And so, you know, if you're a leader in, you know, queer and trans organization 
organizing. It doesn't even have to be, you know, specifically in, in healthcare or whatever, but to, to, to reach out in some way, forming, you know, across the country, forming coalitions where people can like talk about these things, talk about the work they're doing, I think is really powerful. Um, it's made like a huge difference to me and to feel like we have partners in the pursuit of like, you know, just comprehensive sexual health services for everybody in Canada. At least I know that there's a whole bunch of other organizations that, you know, are like our buddies out there doing, doing the work and being tied to us, like feels really good. So as much as you have opportunities for that, I would say like, you know, do that and connect to each other. And um, yeah, I'd love to hear even more about what's going on in the rest of the, the country. I don't hear enough from Alberta, although the Alberta Society for the Promotion of Sexual Health is awesome and follow their work too. Um, but I'd love to hear more uh, from like all, all areas of the country. I think that's it. Yeah. Any last thoughts, feelings, things you want to do? We have like 30 seconds ish we have some housekeeping points to wrap up if you all are done awesome we are. <laughs> sharing the screen for a second thanks um so yeah we are running like a few minutes over time this these wrap-up points should be fairly quick but uh the recording will be available on the cbrc website soon if um any of you all have to head out thank you so much for coming tonight um most importantly we just want to thank everyone um who made this event happen tonight so of course our moderator and panelists uh, Leanne, caitlin and lee our interpreters jillian and tyler um the captioner trish um everyone who attended uh, as well as CBRC and Seth and Stella who facilitated this program for us. Um, thank you so much to everyone. Uh, we really appreciate all the help in making this happen tonight. Um, hi everyone, my name is RT. Can you please let me know if you can hear me? Yep. I see, thumbs up, thank you. Um, and I had the privilege of organizing uh, this amazing panel uh, with the rest of my uh, pivot uh, participants, as well as with Stella and um, Kirk and Seth. Um, before we leave today, we do have a bit of a small parting gift um, that really um, kind of flexed our brains quite a bit. So here's the link to the document. So here is a living resource document that we have compiled. It's a shared document um, hosted by Google Docs. Uh, it is a platform to exchange resources, tools, and tips for folks who are navigating various aspects of healthcare in Nova Scotia. The purpose of this document is really to facilitate knowledge transfer and create stronger connections between members of various queer and trans communities around the province when attempting to access safe, inclusive, and relevant care. So what are the technicalities? The document will be live for one week. Uh, the end date will be April 6, 2022, after which it will be archived and it will be accessible through the CBRC website. During this time, resource suggestions and comments will need to be approved by a moderator before being added to the document. The link is in the chat, which I've just shared, um, and it is will be emailed to all the attendees um, who have registered for it. After April 6th, the email will be sent out to all participants on how to continue accessing the document um, and no more edits will be able to be made. Um, a reminder of community guidelines. Um, community guidelines specific to the document and its use will be displayed on the front page of the document for everyone to reference and before making any additions to the document. Any questions on the document? Wonderful. Um, next slide, please. I just wanted to quickly um, refer to some past uh, pivot projects, so specifically translations, um, navigating hormonal, I think, replacement therapy access in Alberta and as well as Let's Talk's 
Let's Talk Sex Education um, webinar series that was organized by um, um, last year's uh, Pivot uh, folks. Lastly, we just wanted to end on the note of the pets, which have been very present uh, in all of our Zoom meetings um, as we have been planning this for the past number of months. Um, so thank you to all the pets for uh, yeah, being there with us. Here they are. Um, and yeah, just again, thank you so much to everybody for being here. Um, we really appreciate everyone coming and making this happen tonight.